and welcome to Thrift Shop Biography. This is the one about Christopher Reeve. Thank you for listening. Hello, Cleo. Hello, Richard. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I, well, do you know what? I have to say, this book we've been reading this week is the first book which made me cry almost. Yeah, or having a laugh. How bad is your memory? You've wept in so many books. <laughs> No, I think I've just wept when I've been talking to you. What when? <laughs> no, no. You go back and listen to every other one you've wept. Have up. I really? I'm, I'm so sensitive. <laughs> oh, did it move you a lot? Oh my god, it is just like I. Oh yeah, I went through the whole journey with this book because it's so devastating. You know. Oh, we should tell people what we've been reading. What is it? <laughs> what is it? Well, it's Christopher Reeve's book called Still Me, which is a clever title because... He's still him. He spent the later part of his life in a wheelchair and he was still. So it's Still Me. Oh, Still Me, because he's quadriplegic. That's what I thought. Oh, I never got that. He's still, but also he's still him. So it's a very clever title. Yeah. One might be reading too much into it. It was unintentional. It's very clever. Yeah. Well, it's it's very much a book of two parts. It's a book of of Superman's life and then a book of uh, quadriplegic and how it is to be disabled. And it does flick between the one and the other. Every other chapter, really, doesn't it? Yeah, Yeah. it's going to be difficult to remember it to tell the story because it really does go back and forth. So our retelling of it might be a bit disjointed. But anyway, what did you know about him before then? I knew he was Superman. Yeah. And then I knew he had an accident and was quadriplegic. That's kind of it. That is precisely what I knew. But like Superman, that's my era, my age. I just was such a big thing. Yeah, it was huge. And I think as well, when you do play an iconic character like that and you're, you've come to prominence playing that character so we don't know you before, I think it's hard for people to think of you as anything other than that character. Definitely So is. I don't feel bad saying I only know him as Superman. No. Because I think most people do know I agree. Him and, and if you'd have asked me to guess what his life was before then, I, I'd have probably said some sort of beefcake, you know, just somebody who works out a lot. Landed the part, maybe was a model. I had no idea his dedication to his craft. He's a proper real actor. Right. Here's one thing that I was pleased to find out because one thing that I've always <laughs> maintained about Superman, you know that he's obviously Clark Kent, Superman's alter ego, and he plays both of those parts in the film, obviously. Yeah. And people say, oh, isn't Lois Lane stupid because she doesn't recognize that it's the same man? Yeah. And it's like, no, if you watch the film, he is such a brilliantly skilled actor that Clark Kent is very different to Superman. Yes, he totally transforms. And all right, they look, they kind of look the same, but I get, no, he's a brilliant actor if you w- actually watch those scenes critically. But I didn't know that he had all of this classical show. Of course, no, it makes total sense it does. now. And actually, when you think about it, it's probably why he defined that role where nobody else had before, because he took it so seriously. It's always the way. If you've got your foot in the door, you've got to make the absolute most of it and treat it really seriously and make it brilliant. And that's what he did. Yeah, he really did. Anyway. I have to say, I'm not a big superhero movie fan. In fact, I don't think I've watched any since the 1980s. Really? I've got quite into the Marvel stuff. Have you really? I've been led into it, and I'm finding it absolutely Marvellous. Um, it really is. It's amazing. Like, I imagine that it's just too loud and action-oriented, like, now, whereas Superman was very nuanced and about the people. Yes, it is. It really is exactly what you say, but it's awe-inspiring, that the stuff they're doing. I, I can't imagine that anybody else gets anything done in the universe when that much amazing work is being done on these films. It's, it's just incredible. What, CGI? yeah. I would recommend Guardians of the Galaxy. And the scripts are amazing. They've got, they're pitched perfect. Oh, OK. Yeah, I recommend them. You watch one, you might get hooked. Isn't it for children, though? No, it's for everyone. Good stuff like that is for every generation, just like Superman. Is it? Yeah. OK, I won't watch them. No, oh, you're missing out, <laughs> but, you know, it's fine. I haven't got time. I've got to read all these books. Yes. Well, so we should just get on with the life of Superman. Let's get on with it. All right. Okay, Christopher Reeve. Born in 1952 in, in New, York, New City. York City. Yeah. Yeah. 
to a dad who actually was very handsome and yes. very manly and yes. quite supermanish. Have you seen the photos? I mean, and he... his granddad looks pretty similar with slightly whitish hair. Yeah, yeah, strong manly gene going. Yeah, on there. he ends up being six foot four and a beefcake, like you say. Yeah, they're all very sporty. He says Franklin de Olier Reeve, and you, you instantly think there's money there, and uh, it's true. His dad's dad was the CEO of Prudential Insurance Company. At some point later in his life, he says he, his dad and his granddad didn't speak for years. They had a very difficult relationship. And they went to see his granddad. And they went to Tucson. And his granddad had 400,000 acres of land wow. that he had cattle on. I was like, I can't comprehend that. It's like the size of Britain. Yeah, <laughs> like, no, it is. That? It's absolutely That's huge. That's probably the size of Ireland or yeah. something. I can't even comprehend it. Yeah, so they really are from money. Then his dad has sort of turned his back on his rich past and researched into Russian history, probably, well, socialism, probably become a communist. Yeah, he was a real scholar. But probably really snobbish with it. Nouveau working class. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. That's the thing. Well, no, it is. It's like these trustafarians going yes, out like and that. living on a camp protesting against oil and stuff. Lots of very rich kids really rebel yeah. against their moneyed background. And that's exactly what Christopher Reeve's dad was doing. Yeah, and he's like, it's not right to make money from the stock market. Yeah. I'm going to write poems. You know. <laughs> Actually, yeah, but he was quite artistic. Now, here's the thing. We've just read Donald Trump's book. And don't forget that Donald Trump's dad... His firstborn son, Freddie, he wanted him to take over the empire. But actually, Freddie was more of a poet and a scholar. That's true. And it didn't work out. And that's kind of what's happened here with Christopher Reeve's dad. But that Freddie was quite soft, whereas Christopher Reeve's dad is hard. I mean, he's quite a bully, really. Very domineering. Yeah, I've got a theory about him, but in order for it to make sense, Christopher Reeve has to become Superman. So we'll come back to that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but at the moment, yeah, he's at Columbia University. And then Christopher's mum, Barbara Pitney Lamb, is a student at Vassar. And she's 19, Franklin's 23, and they meet. His mother's dad was um, a working class man, a real one, not a fake one. And he'd worked his way up the hard way to become a senior partner in a prestigious law firm. But Barbara's dad, the working class man who built himself up, didn't like Franklin simply because he was a rich man who tried to then get the guise of the working man. So he distrusted him and he didn't want them to marry. But they did. They did. They married in 1951. They had two kids, pretty one after the other, Christopher Reeve and his brother Benjamin. And then they divorced as swiftly after that as possible. He was three years old when they got divorced. Yeah, I know. Isn't that quick? I think it's because dad is a bit problematic. Oh, definitely. But also, you know, they met as students and it's that thing, you know, she had two babies very quickly and all of a sudden her responsibilities shift. Yeah. Whereas he's still a man out there going to all of his student meetings and, he, you know, he's being an intellectual and stuff and she just has to be a mother at that point. She's got two young children. Yeah, so he's suddenly really bored by this woman who just doesn't have anything to talk to him about. Yeah. So it's totally fair that they split up and they both remarried fairly swiftly and the next people sounded much more suited. Well, he remarried straight away. I was really surprised at that. It just, I don't understand these people who <laughs> jump out of one relationship that didn't work right into another. Yeah. Well, it's so irresponsible. <laughs> I love the name of his new wife. So he went on and married somebody called Helen Sch Schmidinger. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a funny name. <laughs> and yeah, and he married her almost just like a year later. Uh, but the mum, Barbara, who had the two boys, Christopher and his brother Ben, she did, it was a couple more years because she just went home to Princeton and her dad actually paid all the bills and stuff. So she was really stuffed after Franklin left her. I do think he's a bit of an arsehole, actually, Christopher Reeve's dad. Did he leave her though or did they just split up? Because he actually applied to work... At Princeton, and the mum's friends all got together and blocked it because he wanted to be nearer his kids. They told the principal that he was a communist, so he wouldn't get the job. Yeah. Yeah, so he couldn't come and be near. Yeah, so yeah. he was trying to be a better dad and come and live near his kids. So I'm not sure that he's completely the baddie in this 
Oh, if you're reading between the lines, yeah. why would this woman's friends block him to get a job at Princeton so he can't be near her and the kids? It tells me that he's a bad so he's guy. No good, and she was trying to run away. Yeah, yeah, all right. Maybe. Good. I mean, he doesn't tell us that. That's me totally making it up. Fine, but it just deprived Christopher Reeve of seeing his dad, who he refers to as Franklin throughout this entire book, mm. which is always a sign that there's a lot of trouble there. <laughs> yeah, right. It's not a father figure. He said he spent his entire childhood trying to be perfect so that he could stand out amongst all the other kids, just trying to be loved by his own dad. He wants his father's approval. You know, you have to think for that brother, Ben, who isn't talked about a lot in this book, but that kid, that big brother went on to be Superman. How can Ben ever compare to that? Can't, can you? I'd like to read Ben's book. I bet he has a massive complex about not being good enough. Yes. He does Christopher Reeve does admit that after his dad left and before the mum remarried that him and his brother were little shits to their mum and she yes. had a very hard time coping with them. Yes. They were so bad that he feels bad about it now as an adult knowing. Yeah. But I guess it's because he's obviously very intelligent, he's obviously very athletic. He's just a boisterous young man who wants to do things all the time he has a lot of energy and i imagine if you are a newly single mother with two young boys it's very hard yeah and plus if it looks like your mom's moved away and and left your dad you might blame her yeah he worshipped his dad hero worshipped him yeah i mean it's definitely his trouble is dad's trouble you sit him on a shrink's couch and it's like it's all about your dad, isn't it? This is all about your dad. Yeah. Because he said that what his dad could do is build him up and crush him, even sometimes within a sentence. Mm -hmm. And you just held out for that building up and then you just get crushed down again. <sighs> that's, that's a mess. And if your whole life is tiptoeing around trying to get this approval, it's textbook similar to becoming an actor, like working for approval and applause What's and stuff. What was nice to read is that his mum remarried this man called Tris and actually he was just lovely and he really looked after the yes. boys. They went on to have more children, but he totally treated them all equally. And he completely paid for Christopher Reeve and his brother's education. Even when Christopher Reeve went on to study drama as an older yeah. teenager, Tristan completely bankrolled it all. Yeah. So he was a really good... Even though he lost Franklin, this problematic dad figure, actually his stepdad was really grounded and really supportive. Yeah, I know. It's really good. Yeah. Because there's a time when I think he said he was a freshman at that at this particular time and he'd gone to visit his dad. He said, Dad, he actually listened. You actually care about me. And he went... Oh, frankly, son, less and less. Less and less. Less and less. That is just, oh. you know, the, the seeds are sown there. That's crushing Yeah. to that poor kid. Yeah, it really is. So I'm glad he had this stepdad at home provided for him, which Me actually too. would have hurt his biological dad, Franklin. It would have hurt his masculinity more as well, having this other dad who was literally financially providing for his sons. That's true. So there's lots of things going on. but There's lots. And of course, where does this lead you? It drives him to find a theatre family, yeah. a lovely, loving, all-embracing theatre family, which he actually finds at nine years old. Yeah. When he played a little part in the Yeoman of the Guard and he heard the applause and he was intoxicated. Yeah, the opera came to town and went to his school and said, can anybody sing? And his hand shot up straight away and said, oh, yes. yeah, I can. Yeah, and that was it. He was smitten from the age of nine with the world of theatre, wasn't he? Yeah. And then he, he just thought, this is it. Then he joined the local Amdram and played loads of parts. And then a professional rep company when he was really young. And John Lithgow was in it with him, who's now obviously famous. So that's really cool. Yes. So he's doing summer stock and stuff. And then when he's 15, he goes to the Williamstown Theatre Festival in Massachusetts. And do you know what? He's so in love with that atmosphere and that group of people that he goes back every year to take part in that theatre festival, even at the height of his film career. Yeah, he says he always kept his summers free. So even when he's been Superman, he goes back to this little theatre festival. Yeah. That just goes to show how much he's in it for the craft of acting. He really is. He said it, there was about 60 people in the company and he was the apprentice and everyone did everything. They all did the lighting and sets and costumes. You know, everyone just chipped in. 
and he found a real family and he absolutely loved it. And he got $44 a week and he had to spend 19 of that on rent, which left 21 for food and fun. <laughs> you know, it's really basic that everyone's in it together. Yeah, he absolutely loved it. Plus, he was having affairs. He was falling in love with all the girls. Yeah. And he was athletic because he was so good at academics and sports at school. So he's really fit and brainy and everything you'd want. So yeah, he said those two summers were the best summers of his whole life. That's amazing. And he's just discovering who you are and girls and acting and fun yes. and being free and being away from home. And yeah, so he's actually getting to be in lots of different types of plays: Death of a Salesman, Brendan Burhan, and Chekhov and yeah, Shakespeare. He's, he's getting, doing he's a lot. really learning on the job, isn't he? Yes, he really is. But his mum impresses on him that you have to get your education, even though he was desperate to be an actor. He agreed with his mum and with Tristan, his stepdad, that he would go to Cornell University. He got offers from like almost every university. This is how intelligent this young man is yeah but he chose cornell yeah they went University. to cornell which had a great arts program but also it was only five hours from new york yeah. so he knew he wanted to go and see shows and see if he could audition and do stuff on the side mm -hmm. good move and he said he totally doesn't regret it because he got to sort of mature yeah without of falling over in public sort of thing yeah <laughs> and triumph and fail when no one's looking which is very wise yeah, he actually got an MFA. He's a genius. Yeah, but he's well. I mean, he kind of is. He kind of is. Yeah. Like, it's no wonder that he got cast as Superman. Yeah, I know. he kind of is. This, he sort of skirts over it in about two sentences, and then there's pictures in the book. Picture of him sailing a yacht. Picture of him abseiling. Picture of him yeah. skiing. But it's, it's like... Yeah, he's an action man. He does. He is. He does everything. There's nothing he doesn't do. <laughs> So while he's at Cornell, he's in quite a few plays in the theatre company. <laughs> yeah, he's doing loads of shows. Yeah, and actually what happens is that agents from New York come and see the new talent. His agent's called Stark, right? Stark Heseltine. Now, that's a very Marvel name. <laughs> I think it's Iron Man. I mean, it's completely unreal. It's a great name. Stark Heseltine. I love that. Yeah, who'd actually discovered Robert Redford a couple of years before. Yeah, and he was Michael Douglas's agent as well. And Richard Chamberlain and Susan Sarandon. He's a real star spotter, isn't he? Yes, yeah. And he spotted young Christopher Reeve mm. in A Month in the Country and he wanted to represent him. And he said, come down to New York and let's have a meeting. But Christopher Reeve is like, you know what? I promised my mum I would stay in university. And so they agreed... He would come down once a month to meet casting agents and producers, and then they would try and find him work in the summer so that he could continue his education at Cornell. I mean, this again, he's so switched on and he's... Yeah, he what's... didn't want to, though. But you know how he said about the excitement of that letter? He didn't even open it for a day and a half because he just he didn't want to read the words, I want to take you on and you can be an actor, because he knew he couldn't let his mum down. So it wasn't easy for him to say that. He was absolutely gutted. But then, to his surprise, the bloke goes, I totally approve. I loved my time at Harvard. You're completely sensible. If that bloke had gone, no, that's a bad idea. You could have a great career now. Would he have caved? Well, the thing is, is that he was offered, I mean, a small part in The Great Gatsby with Robert Redford. And then he got a lead in another film. And actually, he, I thought, oh, I didn't know he was in The Great Gatsby. And then he says, well, un unfortunately, all of this began before the end of my school year, so I couldn't do them. Yeah, they clashed with his exam but week. It's like, wow. Yeah, yeah, it's terrible. He might win the prize for the man who turned down the most jobs in any autobiography <laughs> we've read. It's unbelievable. He like made other people's careers yeah, right. by his um, choices or not choices. Anyway, yeah. So the first summer, he gets a full season contract with the San Diego Shakespeare Festival. Yeah. So he's getting to be in lots of Shakespeare plays. Richard III, Mary Weiser, Windsor, Love Labour's Loft, all in the Old Globe Theatre. I didn't know San Diego had an Old Globe Theatre. Nor did I. But it sounds great. And it gave him the taste of Shakespeare. Anyway, he then went and travelled to Britain for three months. I love reading about this trip. The money he saved from the globe, he went on a three-month trip and he flew into Glasgow in Scotland and made his way all the way down to London. He had three months away. It was a total theatre trip, so he got to go to the Edinburgh Festival, yeah. all the regional theatres, dropped down to Nottingham, went to Playhouse, went to all the small, smaller theatres and every play he saw, he saw some of the best theatre of his life and he went backstage or went to the bar, chatted to all the actors, introduced himself. 
yeah, that's where he found out there's this whole breed of theatre people that live for theatre and aren't interested in film or anything. And he loved it. To me, this really shaped his life. And then when he got to London, he stayed with some woman he'd met in Nottingham and then ended up at the Old Vic for a day, giving them American accent lessons and stuff. And then, uh, yeah, he went to Paris and had a little introduction to um, a top actor there. And it just great. He immersed himself in basically, yeah, European theatre culture. I don't think that left him. I think that formed who he is. Yeah, as like a, a what is he, 18, 19 at this point? Yeah. Not much older. It's amazing that at that point he just goes on a solo trip. Yeah. Because he heard that English theatre is brilliant and he goes to immerse himself in it. I mean, that shows you how serious he, how, how much he loves theatre, you know. Yeah, it does. So, yeah, when he got back to Cornell, it was in 1973, what is he, 21. He's over it now. He's seen the life. He's seen the light. Yeah. And he's like, I can't do this now. So he ends up uh, finding out that you can go to Juilliard. There's an advanced programme and there's only two places on it. And he, he sorted it out with them that they let him transfer for his senior year. So it didn't let his mum down. And he auditioned and he got in. And the other person who got the other place was... Robin Williams. Robin Williams. Amazing. Yes. <laughs> Incredible. Tell you what, they were wise. They picked two good ones there. Yeah, but you know who they didn't pick because they had two good ones? Yes, I do. <laughs> David Hasselhoff. <laughs> we just read David Hasselhoff and he said, I auditioned for Juilliard and I was put on the waiting list because they took Christopher Reeve and Robin Williams. Yes. Hey, Hasselhoff still did all right, though, didn't he? He did all right. He did fine. But he had to work a lot harder for it. Yeah. So amazing. They both were on this intensive advanced course and a lot of the classes were just the two of them. Yeah. Which kind of, you know, they were both of these people. Robin Williams, we all know that he's a cut above anyway, because he does have this amazing, versatile career. But Christopher Reeve, you know, I think people don't unless they studied the nuance between Clark Kent and Superman. (laughs) They might not get that he is also an actor of this calibre. No, you wouldn't necessarily. I mean, I'm jealous to everybody who's ever been on this course. It would be interesting to find out who else got this intensive, almost one-on-one acting training at Juilliard. Yeah, I know. Tell you what really, really made me laugh because they've got this um, dialect coach you know, she, she's in her 80s and she's considered one of the best dialect coaches of all time. You know, they're honoured to be in her class. And she's trying to teach some dialects. But Robin Williams can just come out with any accent ever and be totally fluent in it and spot on. And she just doesn't know what to do with him because she doesn't need training because he's a freak of nature. <laughs> he's a genius mimic. So he's there babbling out Russian and Irish and this all perfect. And... Uh, Christopher Reeve's sitting there taking notes on phonetics and making in his notebook. How can you have those two people in one class for that? It's <laughs> totally different level. And then he said he talks loads about this, you know, what it's like being at drama school with Robin Williams. Because he's like, he'll bring the house down with some comic stuff. Then the tutor will go, yes, you might think you're so clever, but you're just doing comic stuff, you know, just mimicking this and that. I bet you can't do any serious drama, you know, trying to put him down. So then the next day he comes in and does a scene from, I don't know, some massive tragic drama and everyone's weeping. And he's like, boom, <laughs> I can do anything. Yeah. It's an unbelievable talent. Yeah. Incredible. But, you know, he, he says um, that he's just, just always on, you know, even in front of everybody all the time, jokes, this and that. But then sometimes he had to turn off. Mm. And when he turned off, it was Christopher Reeve he turned off too. And that he was the only person he could actually talk his real feelings to yeah. and vice versa. And they became like real brothers. So he, he's the only one that was let in to the real person. Yeah. And they were absolutely the closest friends to the end, right to the end. And I had a little read up of this separately. And I heard that somebody said that they, I think, was it Glenn Close or somebody said that they believed that if Christopher Reeve hadn't died, Robin Williams wouldn't have killed himself. Don't say that. That's that's how close that, they were. No, I know this. Yeah, I, I can't bear that. Sorry, don't say that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but that really is a, a, a true, true brother friendship. Beautiful. Yeah, I, it really is. Mm. It really, really is. Oh. <laughs> 
So, of course, Christopher Reeve is insanely tall and good looking and he gets an audition for a soap opera called Love of Life, which I'm imagining. Mm. Obviously, we don't get American soap operas. I'm imagining it's one of Never these of daytime it. ones like what was the one that David Hasselhoff was on? The Young and the Restless? Oh, Days of Our Lives. Oh, it could have been Young and Restless. Yeah, that sort of thing. Do you know, yeah. and so yeah. he gets a part on Love of Life, which also Warren Beatty started, Bonnie Bedelia. What I don't understand, because we don't get these American soap operas, we know that lots of famous actors come from Australian soap operas and English soap operas. But what I didn't realise was the amount of actors who actually start off in American soap operas. I know, it's true. I think it's George lot, Clooney was in, oh, was he in ER or something? Is that considered a soap? Yeah, but he probably was in a daytime soap before that. So it's, it's something maybe. like that. But I tell you what. He it, looks like he would have been. Yeah, but this makes complete sense. So it was only supposed to be two mornings a week. That was it. Until eventually, yeah, he made the character so popular, the soap got massive and he got famous. And they upped his part and then he had to drop out of Juilliard. But by then, you know, he's getting a grand a week. Yeah, he's on the way. But yeah, the thing about dropping out of his classes, still had a lot of free time so he could go to loads of auditions and stuff. And they ended up getting Broadway shows and managed to juggle them with the daytime soap recording. So he actually was, he was off by then. He played a young Nazi. And this is actually interesting. You think, what could possibly... Playing a young Nazi have to do with Superman. But he said this director said to him, like, everyone knows you're a Nazi, you're in a Nazi uniform, but come in and play it like with warmth and play it soft and with sincerity and then it will really freak people out. Mm. He said he, he thought of that when he played Superman. He's like, yeah, everyone can see you're a strong superhero with superpowers, but if you play it really soft and understated, you know, it's the contradiction that's more interesting. So actually, that in, the young Nazi informed Superman is really interesting, isn't it? You're just soaking it all up, aren't you? And you, you use it when you need it. Yeah, which is why he's such a tremendous actor. It's great. He's always learning. Yeah, he does seem to have humility, doesn't he? He does. Like he is willing to learn. Absolutely. You know, like how Celine Dion learnt singing all through her entire career. Ooh. Even when she's selling millions of records, she's still listening to advice and getting lessons. Yeah. This is Christopher Reeve. He is the Celine Dion of the acting world. <laughs> he is. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's soaking it all up. He doesn't think, oh, I'm the big I am. I know what I'm doing. Mm. He's not David Hasselhoff, who's going out drinking every night and reading his lines off cue cards live on camera. No. Christopher Reeve is actually taking it seriously and learning his lines. Definitely. Oh, how much do you love reading about Catherine Hepburn? Oh, I loved it. I loved the audition <laughs> where he's heard that <laughs> he knows that she's out there in the dark of the theatre while he's on stage doing the audition. He's like, oh, how do I get noticed by <laughs> Catherine Hepburn? He just shouted out into the darkness, Miss Hepburn, I would like to bring you greetings <laughs> from my grandmother, Beatrice Lamb. I believe you were classmates at Brim Mauer. And he says there was a long pause and then out of the darkness came the reply. <laughs> oh, B, I could never stand her. <laughs> He's like, mortified. And so he starts moving the chairs around just to mask his horror. <laughs> and then he does his audition and then as he gets up to leave, he hears this voice going, rehearsal starts 17th September. And he's got the job. And do you know what? You look at them, there's a picture of them together. And I think because they both come from good stock. You know, they're both hearty outdoor types. And that connection probably did help because he was actually auditioning to be her grandson. Yes. And she went to school with his grandmother. Yes. You know, and they're both from rich families, that says, you know. So it just says he's the right man for the job. Right. And then he is a good actor too and he's mm -hmm. handsome and he's got a strong jawline like she does. <laughs> it could be related. It's a good piece of casting. Yeah, definitely. And she really did like almost nurture him like a grandson. Yeah, but and actually, said... while because he was doing the soap opera at the same time, and they were giving him trouble, I think they made a demand on him like you can't do the play anymore because he did it for like a year, I think. Mm. And she phoned up the bosses of the soap opera and gave them hell, yes, so that they would allow him to continue the play. So she really believed in him, and she really defended. Yeah, him. but he says he absolutely adored her, but he was also scared of her because she could also boost you up and knock you down he actually said it, it might be that he got sort of similar feelings to his dad right because when it went to LA he didn't go with it and um, he wonders now he sort of regrets it 
and regrets not staying in touch more. Yeah. Because they stayed in touch all their lives, but he never really visited her much, and he thinks it might be that he kept her at arm's length subconsciously because it was a bit like his dad. She was so harsh, nurturing and harsh. I think you're absolutely right about this. Like, I think it's subconscious that he's distanced himself from Catherine Hepburn. It's such a shame. But do you know what? Because his dad actually distanced himself from Christopher Reeve didn't he? Yeah. Like saying when he was a kid, saying, I care about you less and less. Oh, my God. And then he wrote him that awful letter, which, like, cut them off completely. What? How? Why was that again? Well, when he says that he's, he completely cut off from his dad when he in about 1988, so he'd already been Superman and done all that. And it was as simple as he asked his dad to have a look over a script idea. About the Chile Revolution. Yeah. And his dad went mad and went, don't you use me for your own gains. I'm not being used. I feel used and stormed out. And then sent him a letter saying, I want nothing more to do with you. Well, that's just, he's, he's a nightmare. Yeah, no, I, this is my theory about his dad that I was going to talk about later, but I'll talk about it now. Yeah, yeah. This is his dad's own masculinity. He was the big guy on campus. He was, he come from a rich family. He was built up. He was an intellectual. He was a six foot athletic beefcake. Yes. And then his son who he tried to lord over and would always keep his son in his place, his son became Superman. Right. And so now this guy, Franklin, who his whole life had been the big guy, everybody, the whole world knows that his son became Superman and he could never live up to that. So all of a sudden his son became the bigger guy. And I think that's where this real issue began. I mean, who writes a child a two-page letter telling them that you don't want anything else to do with them when they're a grown adult? It's so bizarre. Yeah, because they're asking you to look over something in a way that that's just a kid wanting to find some way of including your dad and being close. Yeah, such a shame. So he's on Broadway with Catherine Hepburn. Yeah, he he said she was the master of the craft. Yeah. And she, he learnt tons from her. Yeah, and even though obviously she's the draw of the show and getting all of the press, he is beginning to be named right in the last paragraph yeah. of the reviews and stuff. So people are kind of beginning to know who he is. Yeah. And he gets a couple of small film parts and stuff. As yeah, well but, and then Stark, his agent, says, go to LA, I'll set you up with these big agents there. And he goes, and there's loads of parts with massive money, and he just didn't want them. Yeah. You know, he didn't find them challenging roles. So he came back to New York and back to the theatre. And it was when he was back there, his agent went, you've got to, you know, I keep putting you forward for this massive budget film. You've got not a chance of getting it, but you might as well audition, you know, and it's downtown New York at two o'clock or something. And he goes, well, I happen to be getting a train at 5.30 from Grand Central Station anyway, so it's convenient, so I might as well go. And he says he keeps looking back thinking... <laughs> If he hadn't have planned that train journey, he probably wouldn't have bothered. So it's just like by chance he went to this audition yeah. and it was with the director and producer of Superman. And the next day he gets delivered two scripts for Superman 1 and 2 and he goes, any time before that he had to go and fetch a script. He'd never been delivered one. So he's thinking, that's kind of hopeful. And then they fly him to London for a screen test and he's like, I'll just treat it like a holiday because they'll never give me this job. And then when he's actually, only when he's on the plane, thinks, I better have a think about this. And he goes, well, I've seen all these supermen before. It's just like you say, he said, I've seen them when they just put the glasses on. You're supposed to believe that nobody recognises him. And I think I might try and work on the different character. And then he goes, you know, back in the day, you John Waynes and people, they were like mm. this idea of the macho man. He said, I think now it's later in the 70s. I think it's changed. It's the, what do we call it now? The metro... Metrosexual, yeah. Yes. Men are allowed to be a bit more gentle and vulnerable at this point. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's before anyone had that word metrosexual, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but he was onto it. The Clark Kent was the first metrosexual. <laughs> he probably was. But like you say, that's like being the young Nazi playing it differently. You yes. Know, he can do that because Superman has the uniform of the big macho man. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he's brought a lot of thoughtfulness to it. Yeah, it's like we said before, I think that's probably why it resonated so much mm -hmm. with women and men. It's just more accessible. So he got the part. Oh, yeah, and he based Clark Kent a bit more on Cary Grant. Yeah. How many actors have we read? Yeah, I that, know, uh, right? That base 
any part they play on Cary Grant, he was actually the actor's actor, wasn't he? Yeah, I know. They love him. Who knew he was so influential? Yeah. I guess he's kind of considered almost the perfect gentleman, maybe. Yeah, I think that's it, yeah. So they aspire to be like him. Yeah. <laughs> so he gets a part of Superman. And they film it at a time with one bit in this book which really made me laugh out loud. Oh, I know what you're going to say. It's absolutely hilarious. (laughs) He bumped into John Gielgud. So they're at Pywood Studios. He's filming Superman. He is dressed in full Superman <laughs> costume. <laughs> and he bumps into John Gielgud and he shakes his hand. And John Gielgud says, so delightful to see you. <laughs> what are you doing now? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, he said he spent a lot of time hanging around on wires. That's about the only story he gives you. Yeah, right. Yeah, I it's... don't need it. It's just a job. It's work. Got got yeah. that idea. He doesn't really mention it, but he meets this model agent at this point called Gay something. Gay Exton. Gay Exton. Yeah. And that becomes his girlfriend who becomes the mother of two of his kids. Yeah, you're right. He doesn't really mention it, but no. he seems to have a really nice relationship with her. He says they were together 10 years and they split really amicably. So through his whole height of fame of being Superman, he was with... He didn't marry her. He didn't marry her because he said he was damaged by his family with this belief that marriage didn't work. Yeah, so he's with this woman for 10 years and he has two children. Yeah, it it does. I just get the impression it's a good relationship, but he doesn't talk about it. So Superman comes out like around Christmas 1978 and it's an immediate hit and it's accepted. It's that weird crossover thing. Sometimes when superhero movies come out, Sometimes it's only the diehard fans who like it or actually they don't like it and it's the mass cinema audience who love it. But actually what happens with Superman, everyone really likes it. And importantly, the critics. And I think it's kind of largely down to Christopher Reeve being an amazing actor. Yeah. And making it so believable. And again, not playing to type, like being... Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And there's great effects, which were great in their day. There's other great actors in it as well. What's his name? That baddie. Gene Hackman. Gene Hackman's great. Marlon Brando's in it. Was he in the first one? Yes. From reading this, I've worked out Mm -hmm. that I think the first one I saw was probably the third one with Richard Pryor. Right. Which Christopher Reeve says isn't so But he said he didn't like it. He said it was just a, a comedy vehicle for Richard Pryor. Yeah. Which... Of course it was. I absolutely loved it because Richard Pryor was hilarious. Yeah. And I didn't yeah. see any reason not to think that was brilliant because it was all I knew. <laughs> I'm wearing Superman socks now, I've just realised. I put them on this morning without even thinking. <laughs> yeah, I've got a Superman so- I just, I mean, the little hole in the back of one of them, that's how much I wear them and they'll have to go soon. But that's how much it's just filtered into our, you know, yeah, life. Right. It's part of life. Yep. Superman. It's an icon it's for just sure. There. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I know they're still making them and there's different Supermans now and there's a Superman series and all sorts. But he really, really made it huge. Oh, isn't that interesting? I totally forgot that there were new iterations with There's loads yeah, of them. There was Dean Kane in the nineties who played him on TV. That's and right. And now Henry Cavill, who's super good looking and actually it does look like a good Superman. That's but, right. I seem to ignore all that because Superman, to me, is just the definitive one. Yeah, this one is, yeah. But I mean, I wonder if that's because that's our era. It's like Doctor Who, isn't it? No, I really reckon it's the making him real. It's like you can get all these Draculas or all that sort of thing, but as soon as somebody makes them real, they become the defining one. Also, do you know what? Like we said, there are some effects in it, but the effects are uh, achieved by winching somebody at a 40 foot on a crane, dangling them from a wire. wire. Whereas now, you know what we said at the beginning, that I don't really watch modern action superhero movies because I think it's just all CGI. And I imagine the new Superman films obviously will take advantage of that. And I wonder if that robs it of some of the humanity, like Christopher Reeve made it very human. I don't think Mm -hmm. it... You've got to watch Guardians of the Galaxy, then then we'll talk about this. But... I would say what's blowing my mind is that the CGI is some of the best art I've ever seen in my life. Okay. Like, ever. It's unbelievable what art is happening. The sheer beautiful creations and the imagination of artists that are making this CGI, it's elevated to beyond moon landing amazement, I'd say. It's just, it's like, how are they, how is this happening? It's incredible. It's just worth seeing for the CGI. That's what I'd say. Okay, that, all right, I understand all of that. But does the film still have humanity? And humanity. And heartwarming stories. It does, okay. And humour. 
and you cry. You go through the whole gamut of emotions. And good acting. Good acting. Oh, my God. They are amazing. I would never have gone, I've been led into this by others <laughs> and I'm converted. Okay. I would never have touched it with a barge pole. Yeah. yeah. All right. Then I trust your recommendation. I know you still don't have time and you won't bother, but... <laughs> Actually, do I trust your recommendations? Probably not. Because you do watch Neighbours <laughs> and listen to David Hasselhoff. You can't trust me. <laughs> so, he's Superman and he's very, very famous and we all love him. Everyone wants to give him action hero parts and he doesn't want any of them. Yeah. He's trying to keep his integrity. Right, so the list of what he turned down. American Gigolo. I don't know who got that part. Richard Gere. Richard Gere got that, yeah. The World According to Garp. He turned that down and went to his old mate John Lithgow, which made him famous. He turned down Body Heat, which went to his old mate William Hurt, made him famous. He turned down Mutiny on the Bounty, which went to Mel Gibson. Yeah. (laughs) If he'd done all of them, those other people wouldn't exist. Yes. Possibly. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, it would have taken them longer to exist. So, yeah, yeah, it would have taken them longer. Then he took this romantic fantasy somewhere in time with Jane Seymour. Who's heard of that? <laughs> no one. It totally flopped. Well, I was really surprised. Like, I've not heard of it, and this is the first time I'm learning about it. But he says there is a group called Insight, which is the international network of somewhere in time enthusiasts. <laughs> yeah, and it has thousands of members. So somewhere yeah, but thousands line, isn't very many. Is it? Well, they're very passionate about it. They belong to an organisation <laughs> devoted to this film, which kind of makes me think, you know, maybe it's a lost classic. Yeah, but he does say that he thinks he might have played it a little bit Clark Kent because he, he got stuck in that. Right. But maybe, maybe it's all right. Do you know what? Have you seen Superman 4? Because he literally, all he says in the so he did four Superman films. He said first two are brilliant. Third one is a Richard Pryor vehicle. He said then the less said about Superman 4, the better. That's all he says. Yes. But you don't know anything about it. You haven't seen it. I'm not sure if I have. Yeah, I don't think I have. So that's a shame. And then I got really jarred because he says after that, I, I went back um, in the summer to WTF. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> what the? <laughs> I was like, oh, it's the Williamson Theatre Festival. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, does he not know what that stands for? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing that even as Superman, he goes back there to do theatre at the Theatre Festival? I love it. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. And then he's doing um, 5th of July, this play on Broadway with Jeff Daniels of Dumb and Dumber fame. I think 5th of July is the play where he got outstanding reviews and people are actually saying, oh, wow. People who discovered him through Superman, people are saying, oh, wow, Superman can act. Yeah, and of course, we don't get all that being in Britain. We don't in the eighties. We would never have got any of that American theatre stuff. So he's just Superman to us. But I think within America and certainly the industry, people do know that he's bloody good. Oh yes, yeah, they they did. Yeah, definitely. Well, then he did, he did come to London, of course, in uh, nineteen eighty four. But we were just too young to know anything about that. The Asburn Papers in the West End with Vanessa Redgrave, who he'd been in the film that The Bostonians with. Oh, yeah. Which was a Merchant Ivory film. And he did Death Trap with Michael Caine. So he's doing, you know, he's, he's doing a bit of this and a bit of that and taking just what he wanted. With Oh, yeah, he did this film Street Smart and they, it was a really low budget. And they cast Morgan Freeman, which was his big break. And he wasn't that young, but he'd ne- he was actually a grandfather, but he'd never had a break. So they cast him and he was brilliant and he got an Oscar nomination for it. And then he was off. The rest is history from that moment on, which is very cool. It's funny, really, because Christopher Reeve has been in all of these films, which I know, and even some of them, he's actually been (laughs) really prominently part of them on the poster, like switching channels with Burt Reynolds and Kathleen Turner. And I don't remember any of them. And I think it's because he's probably so ingrained as Superman to me that I ignore him doing everything else. I mean, he's even been in Merchant Ivory films like um, Emma, Emma <laughs> Remains of the Day. Remains of the Day, I think I remember him in that. That's possible. That rings a bell. 92, Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson, another Merchant Ivory. Eight Oscar nominations. It was all going fairly well. It's going well. about how he liked say. it. He's got a very well-rounded career. How did we? How did this escape us? He's not just Superman. He's a fully uh, well-rounded theatrical 
actor. I know. And apart from that, he also is an action man as well. <laughs> yeah, he had a healthy work-life balance. He's flying planes and sailing ships. Yeah, and he and, got yeah. into horse riding and he got into it competitively then. He joined the Air Force in the Environment Department, so he's basically doing spy work for people who were trashing the environment and they needed to prove it, photographing from above. And then he helped to save the Chilean actors from execution from Pinochet. That's amazing. And actually flew there and spent time with them. And when the, their execution date passed, he said people started to have hope that they could overthrow him. And so not that long later, he was overthrown. He got involved in tons of stuff. He's just an absolute, a fully living life to the max man. And he'd met the next love of his life. He split up with Gay in 87 and then met Dana. Yeah. True, true love. Well, he was just out one night and she was on stage singing and he's like, whoa, who's that? Yeah, that became his girlfriend. Then he actually married her. Yeah, he did marry her. After five years, they married in 92, but she made him go to therapy to work through all his marriage aversion, which comes from his really troubled past. So they married five years later and then had a kid called Will. Yes, little Will. And in his future, he was looking forward to directing his first big screen movie, when, in 95, he went to Culpeper, Virginia for a combined training event Yeah. on a horse called Buck. It basically braked a fence, threw him over. He's got no memory of any of it, but it seems like his hands were probably caught up in the reins because you'd always put your hands forward to protect your head, and he couldn't. He didn't, and so he broke the first and second vertebrae. He said it's called a hangman's injury because that's what breaks when you hang someone and that's what kills you, obviously. And he was paralysed from the neck down. So then that's the other half of his life. I actually Googled it to see how he's doing now, not realising he died ten years later. Oh, I know, I yeah. didn't know. Yeah, he had ten years of being quadriplegic and he talks at length and detail about... Everything to do with this, how it affected his wife, his children, how he went through suicidal thoughts. Well, you know, his wife, they asked her, because he was in a coma to begin with for about five days. Yeah. And then when he woke up, they established he was quadriplegic. He couldn't feel anything down from his shoulders. And they said there is a major operation we have to do, which there is a 50% chance of it killing him. They have to take his skull off and reattach it to his spine. Good grief. And they said today, even when that happens, you know, his quality of life is just going to be incredibly painful and difficult. Yes. So he's left with the, the ultimate decision, I guess. Do I continue with this life as it is? And as difficult as it's going to be, or do I just die? And he talks to his wife, Dana, and she doesn't want him to. She really doesn't want him to. And that helps Christopher Reeve decide yeah. to stay alive, even though then his mum came in yeah. and said, no, you should die. She was shouting, I pull mean, the plug, pull the plug, and they had to calm her down. Oh, my God. I mean, I don't judge anyone. I think this is such an extraordinarily harrowing experience for any mother, obviously. So, yeah, but it was Dana. Well, he who... said, you know, he, he everyone would be better off if he was gone. And what the words she actually said were, you're still you and I love you. So he said those words saved his life because and that's why it's the name of his book. Yeah. Still me, you know, still me. Yeah. Right. It's yeah, those words. Course. So, I mean, the enormity of this happening to this man, he really does explain it. I mean, I found it such a difficult but moving book to read. His account of just all of a sudden realising you're quadriplegic, I mean... And the strain it puts because it's 24-hour care, the oh, cost of yeah. it, you know, because he wasn't rich. You know, he was better off than most, but that money runs out when it's like $400,000 a year. At least. Oh, hey, yeah, and this is America, right? Well, they have to pay for everything, and your insurance only covers so much. Yeah, but you know what? That last 10 years, he did what he could with his life. He fought for better funding, for research, spinal cord research. Yeah, he became a real campaigner for people with spinal injuries, didn't he? Yeah, he really did. He was always hassling Washington and 
Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Well, he found his purpose, didn't he? The, his new life. Yeah, he, he didn't want to. He resented it. He struggled. Yeah, it, it's you'd have to read it. We can't really explain this. It's so personal, so emotional. Yeah, the most emotional bit for me, I'm going to tell you the bit I cried, and you're probably going to have to explain it. But it's right at the beginning after he had his accident. Yeah. And so everything's in turmoil. Everyone's incredibly upset, and he has to have this operation to take his skull off and reattach, which might kill him. And he said it was the darkest day. He hadn't come to terms of what happened yet, obviously. He was just incredibly depressed and wanting to die. And then they prepare, they prep him for this operation. And for a moment, he's in the room on his own. And he said it was the worst moment of his life. And he said the doctor then burst into the room. Um, He said this short squat doctor came in with a yellow hat on, with a thick Russian accent saying, he said, ah, oh, Mr. Reeve, I'm your proctologist. I must examine you immediately. <laughs> and Christopher Reeve's like, what the hell's going on? And it was Robin Williams. Yeah. And Christopher Reeve the... said that it was, yeah, and he said it was like the first time he'd laughed since the accident, and he kind of knew that it would be all right. I know, that's friendship for you. Robin Williams went there for Mr. Just... Oh, my God, yeah. Oh. Can we read something happy? Next week. <laughs> then he went to the Oscars and I remember watching this. And it was Quincy Jones who got him there. Yes. Who actually really helped Sharon Stone when she was incredibly ill. Do you remember? But he is this lovely person who really reaches out to people. Yeah, he really does. And he crops up all over the shop in totally unsuspecting places. Yeah, and he got... he floated the idea of getting Christopher Reeve to come to the Oscars. Yeah. When he came on stage, he got a standing ovation. I remember it. And I remember Sharon Stone being in that audience, giving him a standing ovation. Little did she know what was going to happen to her in a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's extraordinary that Superman ended up as a quadriplegic and then somehow turned that back in to being somebody who saved lives and was a vital addition to this world, isn't it? He did so much from that wheelchair. I mean, he was having to operate that wheelchair with a straw. He couldn't even use his hands to operate. He had to blow and suck into a straw to move his wheelchair. Oh, God. And I know in the way he describes these these pop-offs when the the ventilator pops off all the time. You think they would have invented something a bit more secure? I was like, can't you gaffer it on? (laughs) What the hell? I mean, it pops off all the time, and then from that point, he can't breathe. Yeah, and it automatically sets an alarm, and then it's just a countdown to when the nurse gets there so he can breathe again. Oh, my God. He's dying every time. Yeah. And the psychological impact of that and the terror, and he says it, describes it, it's like it's terrifying all the time because my life is dependent on this machine and it constantly pops off. And it also relies on the nurse who might not be in the room hearing the alarm. Yeah, and then, or not having gone to the toilet or something. <laughs> and then she's got to come in and Bloody find hell. the bit on the tube to get, yep. fix it all in time. It's horrible. Oh, it's horrifying. And that's 24 hours a day you know his that, whole life. Um, he got cast in Rear Window. They remade Rear Window, the Hitchcock thriller, where the main character is a man in a wheelchair. And at one point... Where the baddie comes in and cuts Christopher Reeve's tube so he can't breathe. Christopher Reeve said, let's do that in real life. And everybody on the film set is like, what the heck? But they did. So when he's doing that on screen, when the baddie cuts his pipe, he's literally suffocating. That was actually his real experience. Yeah. Christ. See, he's a good actor. <laughs> He'll do anything for his art. Oh, my God. And then, I mean, we need we need to wrap this up. But he also still continued to work in the arts because, of course, he directed that film with Glenn Close. And who else was it? In the Gloaming. Right, yeah. Yeah, and Whoopi Goldberg. Yeah, it's a script about a young man who gets AIDS and has to go home to die and confront his estranged family, which he actually could relate to. It's like he says... He can relate to that kid who's dying of AIDS and he goes home to die because his parents must have had an issue with him being gay. He said, it's the same for me. I had all this beef with my dad. We hadn't spoken since 1988. As soon as I this accident happened to me, my dad was there for me. My mum was there. My brother was there. Everyone was there for me. My friends, all the half-brothers, sisters, everyone. And it, it just wasn't relevant anymore. All this it's just insignificant, the little, little rouse. And it, that's a lesson right there. So at least that came of it. So yeah, 
He managed to turn the worst thing possible into something, but he still describes it as just being hell. Yeah, of Poor course. man. Yeah, I know. It's a nightmare. And he also wrote this beautiful book documenting this, book. this journey, you know. Yeah. So I thought, obviously, it's not going to be an easy book to read, <laughs> I read about somebody who became a quadriplegic, but I just was so entirely moved by it. Yeah. I didn't expect it, you know, to the point where like other, I don't like the word tragic figures, but like Sinead O'Connor and Billie Holiday, they really moved me. I didn't expect Christopher Reeve to move me as much as they did. And he really, I have such, I've always liked him and I've always respected his artistry because of that Clark Kent Superman nuance but I now fully respect him as a man and a human being I think he's exceptional yeah agreed and he really he is like Superman in real life isn't he He he's a Superman ah yeah he's a Superman thank you so much for listening to this episode of thrift shop biography we love making this podcast and we're absolutely thrilled that so many of you are already listening you could really help us out by leaving us a review somewhere wherever you listen to this podcast and if you could share us tell your friends about us or drop some links on social media we have a facebook page called thrift shop biography so make sure you come over there to hear about the episodes first and what else we're up to okay see you next week and if you're new here there are loads more episodes now to go and listen in the back catalog so make sure you go and enjoy them okay thank you very much